Hello, my name is Christopher Donald. Uh, welcome to my channel and uh, welcome to what is going to be the, the first episode in my podcast, The uh, Business of Art. So the idea of this um, podcast is that I, I want this to be a, a series of conversations, uh, essentially talking about um, the business side of ceramics and the ceramics industry and just some of the considerations that um, you should take into account if you are curious about the industry, um, looking at just getting starting in it. Um, maybe you, you've been in it for some time and you're uh, in a specific niche and you're looking to kind of expand or think about what other things you can do in it. Hopefully it's, it's going to be uh, useful for everyone. Um, and what I'd like to start off with is just talking about uh, education, like how, how and where you get trained to work in um, the ceramic industry and um, some of the, the pluses and minuses of each of those um, options. Um, <clears throat> first off, uh, let's talk about uh, being self-taught. So a lot of people who start in this field, uh, they, they do it by just having a, a genuine uh, interest in making things in clay. Maybe they stumble into it. Maybe they're um, introduced to it in, in grade school or high school. And, um, and you just, start making work and you, you get better at it. Um, being self-taught is absolutely fine. It It's gonna make certain avenues more difficult for you. Uh, if you want to teach, um, being self-taught is essentially a non-starter. You may be able to potentially get a job teaching in a charter school or a private school, but it's very unlikely. Um, the problem is that there, there's so many people who have degrees and teaching certificates that your competition is is going to be more than you can probably um, do anything with. You could open your own um, venue for teaching, your own gallery, your own things, but when you're self-taught, it's, it's pretty much you are a small business. And um, so you have all of the, the pluses and the minuses of essentially just being a small business owner uh, when you're, when you're self-taught. And one of the downsides of being self-taught is that it can be difficult to get the big picture on your industry and to um, get out of ruts. One issue that I've, I find with people who are self-taught is that they, um, like, like good is the enemy of excellence. Um, you, you get something which is sellable or which is people really enjoy, and you just, you just stay down that road. Um, because it's working and you don't either have the time to improve or the inclination to improve and you end up doing yourself a disservice and potentially make less money and are less successful because you get into this rut and you kind of stick it out um, <clears throat> and you can always get better and I think when you start selling um, and you don't have a community around you, you don't have um, an infrastructure underneath you. You don't have, um, you don't have this network built up of, of supporting your creative process. I think it could be really difficult. So when you're self-taught, it, it's often important that you, you still try and put yourself out there. You do workshops, you take classes if you can, you get a community of artists around you, you find people whose opinion you value and that you'll listen to. And you, you want to make sure that, um, you continue to develop. So being self-taught, absolutely fine. I know some very successful people who are entirely self-taught, uh, but there's gonna be some net negatives if you go that route. Uh, kind of partly like being just self-taught is working for a specific artist. So maybe you're self-taught and then you get a job working in someone else's studio. That can be a really good way of learning, um, depending on who it is that you're working for. It's it's a way of, it's almost like a shorthand um, or a shortcut for getting into the industry. They'll have made a lot of the mistakes that you might have made. They'll show you how they've learned to run a successful art business. You need to be careful that you don't pick up their bad habits and that you only pick up the good habits from them. And that can be hard to do um, if you don't have a formal education behind you to kind of help educate you to what are the, the pluses and minuses of what you're seeing happen in their in their scenario, in their studio. Um, 
I've, I've worked um, in other people's um, studios and I, I found it to be exceedingly valuable. Um, depending on where that person is in their career, it can also help leverage your success and give you some contacts that you might not otherwise have. A lot of that's going to have to do with the relationship that you have with the person that you're working with. I've always said that it is far better to have somebody pay you for you to learn than for you to pay someone to learn. <laughs> and I still think that that's true. Uh, it's nice if you're getting any kind of a paycheck to say, learn how to wheel throw uh, and get better at it on somebody else's dime. That's, that's fantastic. Um, along the same lines, working for an art studio. Uh, that would be less of like a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-two -on -two or three kind of a situation and more of like, um, uh, at one point I interviewed for um, a pottery, a production pottery in Dover, North um, New Hampshire. And um, that was a large operation. It's basically almost like a factory. Everything's handmade, um, but it was a big operation. They had like 50 employees. That would be the kind of situation where you're working for like an actual, like an art studio uh, of some significant scale. And again, it can be fantastic experience. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful in the larger situations because they tend to want to kind of assembly line do the work. So they'll, you'll just be a wheel thrower where you're just a decorator and they don't tend to let you learn the different stations because they, they don't make money on that. They, they really want to train you to throw their work or train you to do their um, um, hydraulic press stuff or, or whatever. And, and that... Once you're trained, that's how they start making money. So they don't want to keep retraining you constantly. But if you're there long enough, you can probably learn more things. Those jobs are fairly low paying uh, in general, but you learn a lot. So again, they can be quite valuable. Um, community art classes. So many, many people come um, to ceramics this way. Um, or the place that I, I teach at Claymakers. Um, Claymakers is, is like that. And, um, and this, this series is, is partially aimed at um, our assistance program at Claymakers, um, to give them some more resources in, in their creative journey and in their um, ability to work with professionally within, this, within the ceramics industry. Um, so community art studios, the, the benefit of them is that they're fairly accessible. Uh, generally, there's no level requirements or anything. Anyone can take most of the classes. There's going to be a mixed bag as far as the people that you're learning from. Um, some may not be that much more uh, advanced than you are as a student. Um, some may have been doing it for 30, 40 years. Um, so you kind of have to pick and choose depending on where you are in your development, who you're learning from. Early on, it's probably not going to matter all that much. You just be a sponge and just learn from everyone you can take a class from. But um, you have to think a little bit about what your goals are. Um, even something as basic as, are you more of a, um, a sculptor, more of a, um, uh, you know, someone who's more conceptual? Are you looking more at doing functional work, um, commercially functional work, uh, decorative gallery work? Like what, what niche are you kind of more aiming at? And, and you can kind of cherry pick the instructors that you're, you're taking uh, to help you out with that. But um, community classes are awesome. And um, they're also a great way for you to be less in isolation, uh, which, especially if you're self-taught, is a real danger and it's a real problem. It's a real problem outside of academia. The moment you're done with a program, you can fall into a real chasm um, where, you know, the, the stereotype with, with, ceram with the art field is, is the whole, like, um, New York... Uh, artists living in a penthouse, going to parties all the time. When the reality is that most studio artists are, are fairly solitary. You, you, it's good if you're an introvert. Uh, you, you work pretty much at least nine to five hours and you don't see a lot of people. And at the same time, you're, you're required to be fairly social and really good at maintaining personal relationships and connections with people and at selling and marketing yourself. Uh, so it, it's odd, but it, it, at, at its baseline, it, it can be a little lonely. So having a community around you is very important. It helps kind of build you up. Um, workshops. So similar to, maybe more the, somewhat like a step up from community art classes, 
our workshops, especially at places like Penland or Archie Bray or Aramont, um, or um, oh, I didn't think of a couple of the other ones. Um, anyway, but there's there's lots of them everywhere. Uh, Santa Fe workshops. Um, so workshops are more um, more well known artists. Generally, they're more studio gallery artists rather than production artists who do short term classes and um, often uh, be a couple of days or a week or sometimes even two weeks. Some of them you can go and you can stay for amounts of time to do the workshops. And they're fantastic. Um, and workshops are a really good way, too, of making kind of higher level connections with people within the industry. Um, and if you play your cards right, you can learn a lot of information, even outside of the class, uh, from the people that are putting on these workshops. So workshops are, are invaluable. Um, if you're interested in teaching, it depends on what kind of teaching you want to do. I, I highly encourage people who are thinking about teaching to decide if they want to actually be a teacher or if they're thinking about teaching because they think it's somehow like a good square job to hold down while you're being an artist. I'll be honest with you, there are far better square jobs to have um, than working in the very field that you're needing to do your work in. If you're creative, I would discourage you from doing a creative day job unless it is directly applicable to building your skills. So working for another studio, uh, working doing production ceramics, something like that is directly applicable to you becoming a better artist. But things like teaching, um, things that are creative, being creative for other people, often drain you and you think you're gonna have the energy to pursue this gallery arts career on the side and in your off time. And maybe when you're single, you do. But if you want to date, if you have kids, if you have other things that start coming into play, that time evaporates very quickly. Um, and you'll find that you're just drained. You, you give it all in your day job and then you have nothing left for yourself. I, I would encourage people who are thinking of, of kind of self-supporting their, their creative career to find something which is more of like a white collar job um, and probably not teaching. Teaching does not pay well, frankly, and it's very, very work intensive. So if you're looking at it as kind of the easy way out, I, I would say that it absolutely is not. Um, so if you want to teach, be serious about teaching. And if you're serious about teaching, what level are you serious about teaching at? The requirements are really different depending on which one you want to do. So if you want to teach at a grade school or high school level, you're probably going to need a teaching certificate and you're probably going to need a bachelor's of education degree. Um, for teaching at private schools and for charter schools, you could get away with having like a BFA degree in ceramics and no teaching certificate, but it gets to be more difficult. The teaching certificate is very helpful. And that's a, a separate degree from... Um, either your education degree or your ceramics degree. Um, there, there are some backdoor ways of getting into teaching. Um, you can simply work for an institution that you would also like to teach at. So your day job is working at a university. Um, and then you just talk to the people who run the arts program and say, hey, I'd like to actually have a degree in ceramics and I'd love to teach a class. And believe it or not, that works pretty well, like nine times out of 10. So um, you can do it that way. Um, so there's lots of ways of kind of building up teaching experience. When you're getting your degrees, either your bachelor's or your master's degree, um, and you think that you want to do teaching as well, work for opportunities where you can teach while you're in school. Those are really helpful. And, and the count as experience at those institutions. So it can be extremely helpful for giving you a leg up once you're done with your degrees. Um, so let's talk about degrees a little bit. Um, an associate's degree in, in fine art. Uh, much more rare now. My, my parents, uh, that's what they were pursuing for, for their generation. And associate's was, was a, a good degree in the arts. Uh, it's a two-year degree. Nowadays, associate's degrees are much more for um, um, the trades, um, plumbing, welding, carpentry, things like that. 
and they're seen as being kind of like job preparation degrees. Uh, they're preparing you to work in a specific industry. And they're less applicable now for, say, ceramics than they, they used to be. Um, more now, the, the starting degree for ceramics is going to be a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, a BFA. And um, with a, a bachelor's degree, your bachelor's is basically where you learn your core skills. So your bachelor's degree is when you learn how to throw, you learn how to uh, maintain kilns, build kilns, mix glazes, um, all of the core skills that you'll then later kind of refine and use to create your work. That's your bachelor's degree. Some programs are a little bit more um, uh, technical. Some programs are a little bit more um, kind of creative. But in general, your bachelor's is, is, is that kind of foundation building time. So um, you, you are going to pretty early in your career need to start making some choices about who you think you are as an artist and what you're really interested in. Are you going to be doing, um, I don't know, installations, uh, sculpture, ceramic work for um, architects, for um, in buildings, uh, for things that are outdoor installations? Are you going to be doing conceptual work, um, spaces, uh, working on ideas, more sculptural work, more functional work, um, smaller scale, lower price, higher production? Um, lower scale, higher price, uh, lower production, kind of see where you think your interests lie. And you're going to want to really try and pick a bachelor's program that plays to the strengths of what you're anticipating you want to do. And it, it sounds like it's really early in the process to have to make that kind of a call. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. You do your best. Um, but most programs specialize. And when you look at the teachers that are teaching at these programs, they tend to fall into a very specific camp. And, you know, like um, Chicago Art Institute might be really conceptually based for its current group of, of artists. Maybe there's one functional potter. Um, Kansas City Art Institute might be super functional and they've got like one sculpture person. Um, maybe you really want to do representational sculpture work, and so you have to look for a school that specifically has people doing representational ceramic sculpture work. It's not just that they're going to teach you the skills, the core skills that you need to learn in your bachelor's degree. They're also going to be the beginning of your pyramid of support uh, for your career, and these are the people who will help you get recommendations for graduate school, for internships, for residencies, for jobs. Um, you need them to be your kind of people to be the best situated to support you and support your career. Um, all right, so basically your bachelor's degree is, is learning how to do your craft and your master's degree is learning why are you doing your craft. Uh, your master's degree is generally honing your thing. So you spent your bachelor's learning how to operate, basically assembling a toolkit. So you now have the toolkit and you've been toying with who you are and you've been trying to figure out who you are and you think you know. And so you put together your portfolio and you sell that future version of yourself to get into a master's program. Um, in between your, P, your, your bachelor's degree and your MFA, you'll often do some kind of a residency, residency or an internship. And that residency or internship is also highly influential on which master's program you get into. They're very competitive, uh, especially the top ones. And you should anticipate taking two years between your bachelor's and your master's. And that two years is your first year is you hopefully landing an internship or residency with someone who does the kind of thing you think you're going to want to do and is influential at it. You work for them for a year. Hopefully you do fantastic. They give you a letter of recommendation and help you apply in a second year 
for an MFA program. Your second year, you might continue to work for that person or maybe go on to another residency, but your application year is a dead year to you. You, you need one year to build up that recommendation. Then you spend the recommendation in the following year. And then at the end of that year, you start master's, your master's program, hopefully. So that's basically how it should work. So your master's degree is all about um, refinement. It's about concept. It's about um, trying to, to boil down and distill what it is that you're bringing to the table, what it is that you have to say as an artist, as a ceramic artist. Um, and it's, it's also kind of building towards where you think you're going to launch your career. What trajectory are you going for after you leave your master's program? Are you going to spend a lot of time doing student teaching, um, uh, spending your summers going and doing workshops and, and other residencies and things and trying to become a teacher? Are you going to spend your time trying to refine your craft and aim towards being a studio artist? Um, maybe who you want to be a name. You want to be someone of notoriety at some point. And um, you're building your contacts. You're building your connections. You're building up your thesis and what it is that you're about, and you're aiming it towards that. So that's your master's degree program. Um, that used to be the terminal degree, honestly, for studio arts, but increasingly schools are realizing there's money to be made, and if they now require a PhD for things, then now you gotta go get a PhD. So PhDs are now kind of the terminal degree for a lot of studio programs, which is insane because for most people, you're essentially self-employed at the end of this. So it's like, how overqualified do you want to be to hire yourself? Um, but yep, PhDs now. So a PhD program, so your bachelor's is your toolkit. It's how do I do what I want to do? Your master's is your, is your explanation of yourself. Why do I do what I want to do? And your PhD is why do they do what they want to do? It's, it's, an ex, it's a deep dive or an exploration into something bigger than yourself. Um, you'll have a specialty, like a certain time period, a certain type of work. Uh, you might go and study, um, I don't know, rural Chinese um, pottery, um, Af Afghanistan mountain pot pottery, um, historical Maolica versus Majolica work, it, things like that. You write a dissertation, a book, um, that's your PhD. So um, PhDs are also for people who might think they want to be a department head at some point, not just teach, but run a program. Or maybe people who think they want to go into museums and into um, research or into um, uh, curation to be a, a museum curator. That's a PhD program. Um, so, so there you go. Um, one, one other like kind of overlooked uh, piece of training is uh, work study. So when you are doing your uh, bachelor's degree, especially, or your master's degree, uh, look for opportunities to work for your department or to work within the school. And you will learn things helping to run a ceramics program that you cannot learn just as a normal student. They will give you an insight into just how it all works and what is required to keep it working that you won't get in any other way. Um, so being a work study is fantastic. And again, they're paying you <laughs> to teach you about things that are invaluable. Um, it's also where a lot of um, kind of like studio assistants um, and um, studio like techs come from is they, they tended to be work study people and then they end up going more into the tech side of things. Um, Along those lines, um, being a workshop assistant. So you can be an unpaid volunteer at a lot of the big um, places where they do workshops at Penland, at um, Aramont, and things like that. And um, the people that you're assisting are, again, another piece of your support pyramid. Uh, these are people that can help you. These are people who you can learn from, people you should listen to. And... Um, and all of these connections, it, as much as we don't want to think of the arts as being like this massive community effort, um, none of us really make it entirely on our own. And 
for large chunks of this industry, it is very reliant on your personal connections with people and on your reputation. So that's something you need to take into account and be thinking about because if you're not a people person, you might need to start learning how to be a per people person. And those are learned skills. You can learn how to be better with people. You can learn how to sell yourself. You can learn how to speak better. You can, you can learn how to articulate your ideas and how to explain them succinctly to a different audiences. These are skills which are key to doing a lot of different things in a lot of industries, but specifically in the arts. Um, if you are an artist who can speak clearly and concisely and can break down ideas in a very specific way, you will go far and you have what it takes to be like an arts administrator um, or to be a department head or something like that. So, we, you know, soft skills aren't sexy, but they are, are invaluable. Um, student teaching, I've, I've touched on that. Um, something you should do while you're getting your degrees if you are interested in being a teacher or learning how to teach. Um, but there's also the chunk of student teaching which happens as part of getting your teaching certificate. So as part of getting your certification, you do time working with um, an instructor in the grade level that you're getting certified for. So if you're K through five or if you're um, high school or whatever, you're gonna go and work with a seasoned teacher uh, in their school under them and kind of, they, they teach you the ropes. Uh, I did mine at the high school level and um, you, you learn a, a lot more than you necessarily learn just in school. Um, that's where you learn classroom management, which is at the heart of really being an effective teacher at all levels, frankly, but um, at the lower levels, oh my, yeah, you, you'd better be able to control your classroom. If you can't, you cannot teach. So these these grizzled veterans that are the ones that you do your student teaching with, these, these are the guys and the and the and the ladies that are, are like, okay, here here's the real, here's how it works. <laughs> and you'll you'll get all your tips on how you manage students and even just how you develop your voice. There's there's a specific voice that you have to use <laughs> when you're teaching. Um, and you generally kind of mimic the one that whoever's training you has. Um, so, so if you do that, uh, make sure you, you try and get a, an instructor that you think you have a good fit with. You can spend a lot of time with them and you're gonna pick up a lot from them. Um, and then finally, as far as um, opportunities for, for education and training, um, residencies. And so the residencies that I mentioned, um, trying to do between your bachelor's and your master's degree, but also you can do residencies before going for a bachelor's degree or after you get your master's degree. Uh, residencies, there, there are some that are considered late career residences. Um, very prestigious, uh, where you're given a chunk of time just to work on a body of work on a show or a material for a book or, or something like that. Um, so residencies are, are, are a continuous thing through, through your career. Uh, and there's many different levels of them, uh, many different uh, types, and um, they they are they are excellent. Um, they are mostly unpaid. Mostly, you will not get financial support for for doing them, and they're kind of a good version of a thing that uh, maybe you save up for. Uh, again, it's kind of the self funding, like funding your own career. They're, they're really valuable and you probably may not get a grant to, to do them, um, but you should probably do them anyway, even if you have to pay for it. Uh, one thing to think about too along this line, um, between your bachelor's and your master's degree, you're looking to do some kind of residency or residencies. And if you are able to save up money before going for your bachelor's, you should keep that money um, and not spend it on your bachelor's degree and you should take out more loans. You cannot get loans to go generally for anything like a residency, but you can get loans for your bachelor's degree and for your master's degree. So take on that debt if it allows you to bankroll more education for yourself and more opportunities for yourself. This is a fantastically um, 
competitive and difficult industry and every angle and every advantage that you can give yourself is worth taking. So when you apply for a job, there could be as many as 2,000 people applying for that job. And you need to be the one that they're going to pick. And of the five, they're even going to talk to at all. They can be very picky. They, they have the opportunity to be very picky because they have the pick of the litter. They pick anybody they want. The whole world wants a job. So, um, and, and you, I, I'm going to talk more about this for the different careers that you can go into portions of, of the, um, of this series. But, um, if, if you want to teach, you're, you're going to need to be prepared to move, um, getting teaching positions, they open up nationally, uh, and there might be three a year and, if you get one, you move to wherever the heck it is, Nebraska or wherever, because you you have to build up those teaching um, chops to get the, the dream jobs and the prestigious jobs that you want down the road. You just got to take the jobs they give you when they do. Um, so anyhow, but um, thanks for joining me for this. So this this was meant to just be an overview of the education part of the ceramics industry. I'm going to be doing some future videos on individual um, kind of job, uh, like like swaths of jobs, like um, which which types of jobs are possible to have within the ceramics field. Um, you know, like do you want to teach? Do you want to be a production potter? Do you want to um, work for museums? Um, which which kind of area are you looking to aim at? And in fact, which combination of those? Because usually most most um, uh, ceramic professionals do more than one at, at at least some point in our careers, if not simultaneously at, at different points in our careers. So um, um, please um, subscribe and um, you'll get notified about new videos. I should be doing a couple of these a week um, for a while. There's quite a bit to, to kind of explain about our industry. Uh, we've been around for like 3,000 years, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, but um, I'll see you again back here soon, so take care. Good luck. Bye.